So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you are all well. Thank you very much for joining us for this very special event. My name is Michael Newman. I'm the Chief Executive of the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all and to see you all. Uh, we welcome our members, uh, and it's lovely to see so many of you here, and welcome also if this is your first AJR event. Uh, and if it is your first encounter with us, then uh, it's a chance for me to give you a, uh, a brief uh, introduction about the AJR and our work and our mission, uh, which, as, as our members will know, remains to represent and support Holocaust refugees and survivors by providing social welfare services, uh, something which I think we all recognise has become even more important and critical in these recent months. We do, of course, miss the uh, in-person interaction with our members, and we know uh, at the same time that our online activities have transformed our work during the pandemic and enabled us to reach and contact with members from whom we don't always hear uh, so often. It's also helped us reach new audiences and make new friends both in the UK and overseas. So if you know of anyone who you think can benefit from our services. We are in a very fortunate position of being able to offer transformative support uh, to survivors and refugees, in some cases to their families. Please do let us know. Alongside uh, that social welfare support, the other limbs of our work are to engage with the next generations and to help advance the teaching and learning about the Holocaust and its commemoration. So we will shortly be circulating details of a two day conference on topics of interest to the children and grandchildren of the refugee generation. And please do also look out for the new Next Generations page in the AJR journal. As uh, many of you will know, this is our 80th anniversary year and we're thrilled to be launching two special commemorative projects, two educational and commemorative projects that will reflect our strong commitment to preserving the legacy of the refugees and survivors, particularly as we move uh, from the living to the documented history uh, and we're building resources that can help those younger uh, subsequent generations connect to their past and heritage. And I think that brings us neatly on to our event this afternoon. I'm delighted that we're joined by Barbara Winton and later on we look forward to hearing from Lord Alf Dubbs, and we're also honoured to be in the company of not just one, but two ambassadors. So our programme today is that Barbara will be making a presentation about the excellent new website she's built and curated about her late father, uh, Sir Nicholas Winton. This will be followed by a Q&A that will be moderated by my colleague, Alex Moores, the AJR's Head of Educational Grants and Special Projects. And both uh, during uh, Barbara's presentation and the Q&A itself, we encourage you to submit questions and comments using that chat function. Barbara's presentation will be bookended uh, by some remarks, first from His Excellency, Libor Seke, uh, the Ambassador of the Czech Republic, and later on from His Excellency, Robert Andrzejczak, the Ambassador of Slovakia. In welcoming both ambassadors, we note also that today marks the anniversary when Nazi Germany broke the Munich Pact and invaded the Czech provinces of Bohemia and Moravia and established a protectorate over Slovakia. And after uh, Ambassador Andrzejczak's remarks, we will hear later from Lord Dubs, who I mentioned, who, like Barbara, is well known to the AJR. As some light housekeeping, we will be keeping everybody on mute during the event to save any background noise. Uh, today's event is being recorded and will be available on the AJR's YouTube channel in a couple of days' time. Uh, and uh, just a thought, actually, maybe we should uh, post the link to Barbara's website, to the websites, uh, in the chat function uh, uh, after or once the presentation has started. So with that, it now gives me great pleasure to invite Ambassador Secker to share some thoughts with us. Ambassador. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, thank you so much, AJR. And my special regards to Barbara and Nick Winton and uh, Lord Dabbs. 
Well, I'm really very pleased and honored to have this uh, opportunity today to take part in the launch of this fantastic website. I have been asked to say some words about uh, my relationship with uh, Nick Winton and his story. I think it's uh, uh, Sir Nicholas Winton. It's uh, how he hardly needs any any introduction. Uh, on the eve of the Second World War, an unprecedented time of fear and hatred, he has proven to be a man of exceptional courage and humanity. He organized the rescue of uh, 669 mostly Jewish children from the occupied Czechoslovakia and saved them from the same sad destiny that has uh, met many of their peers which didn't have the same amount of love. Uh, it fills me today with joy to see they got their chances to live wonderful lives and to raise beautiful children. A destiny that was supposed to be taken away from them. Uh, I was even able uh, to meet with some of the uh, Winton children and their descendants in person during my tenure as ambassador here in London. And it was all the time exciting to listen to their stories and to learn about their achievements. Yet, uh, what I personally value almost equally in uh, Sir Nicholas is his outstanding humility and modesty. Despite, an, uh, despite the exceptionality of his actions, he never uh, really seek recognition, fame, or social approval for everything what he did. His story went basically unnoticed by the world for nearly 50 years until 1988, when it was discovered by the BBC and he finally received the praise he certainly deserved. These are qualities which are becoming harder and harder to find these, these days. So let me at this point thank again uh, to Barbara, uh, his daughter, for creating uh, this excellent website. The history with a big H has taught us that it doesn't pay off forgetting about our own history. Thank you so much for your attention. Ambassador, thank you very much for your remarks and your greeting and uh, it's very nice to see you again and being part of our event. Uh, and, with, and with that, I would like to hand the floor over to Barbara Winton, a long-standing friend of the AJR. Uh, we're delighted to host you this afternoon and uh, to give you the platform to talk about this uh, fantastic resource that you've built. Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to the AJR for offering to, um, to do this event. Um, when we put the website together, we weren't really quite sure how to get it known to everybody apart from sending emails around. So this is a lovely opportunity to kind of christen it and make it in a, an occasion rather than just kind of tell people it's there. So really appreciate that. <clears throat> So to start with, I'm just going to talk about the website in general, and, and then I'll talk about the exhibition, which is really what we're going to spend the time on. First of all, I have had a sneaky look through all the people on the, on the site, and it's really wonderful. I'm sure I haven't seen everybody on there, but I've seen a number of Nikki's children on there, Renata Collins from South Wales, um, Vera Schaufelt from London, and particularly, I wanted to say hello to Alice Masters, who is in Washington, well, Maryland, and how lovely it is to see you all. And it's just delightful that you're here with us. And if there are more, you must you must wave or send me a message. Um, it's really great. All, all the children who have become part of a, an extended um, Nikki's family. So. I became a custodian of the archive when my father died, and it seemed to me that it was an important resource for the future, that it should be kept together and used, um, not only as kind of history, 
but as a resource to educate people about that period of time and about my father, what he did then, but also who he was and how he lived his life and how the way he lived his life can be an inspiration to people into the future. The other thing I wanted to say, particularly at the beginning is, I, I'm not a historian, I'm not a, a, a professional researcher. My, I came into this as my father's daughter, uh, ho holding his material. And what, what I aim to do is to make his part of the story, his jigsaw piece in the story of the kinder transport and the Holocaust available to people. And I'm delighted that there are so many others holding their own jigsaw piece of the puzzle and making them available to people. That there are people like Henry Warriner who've written his aunt Doreen's uh, biography. Um, there are people now celebrating Trevor Chadwick for his own contribution. And even further afield, there's um, the Marie Schmolker Society who are uh, working on the work that Marie Schmolker did in, in the Czechoslovakia in that time. And also people who are now making films about people like Truce Weissmuller and Wilfred Israel in the greater kinder transport. So I feel my role is just my father's piece. That is what I intend to do but I am very much admire the work of all those other people to publicize the other people involved at the time. So one of the things that has made the archive special is that my father kept so much material from the time. He took a lot of photos and he wrote a lot about his experiences before the war and during the war and afterwards. And I think having those personal historical testimonies, I think we all must agree are very valuable. And so I'm lucky to have that in the archive and that's what I wanted to make available to people. So the exhibition really is just a slice of the archive. My original task was to catalog the whole of the archive to make it available, but this is a huge task and whether I ever get to the end of it, I, I'm not sure, but it seemed that making a slice of it available as soon as possible so people could see the range of what, what was there so that if they wanted more information, they were hungry for more, they were researching that period, they could get in touch through the website and see what was there. So I am going to now attempt to share the screen, which will then enable me to show you through the website. Right, so this is um, our homepage of the website that we've just put up. The, uh, the original reason for the website, the website has been available for some years, but it's now been updated and made a lot more user friendly and um, designer friendly, I think. The original reason for it was to give a bit of information about my father, but particularly to allow those people who came on the Czech and Slovak kinder transport and their descendants have access to information that they really were looking for to demonstrate how they came to this country. I, I get emails quite regularly from people who have discovered their, their parents or their grandparents' history by looking on this site and finding their name. So if you'll see across the top here, home, this is the page, then there's the exhibition, then there's this page called Winton's Children. I'm going to click on that because this is what people are often after and they're looking for this list, the list that was in the scrapbook that uh, my father had at the end of the kinder transport. The scrapbook's now at Yad Vashem, but this list, if you can see, has names, dates of birth, and addresses. And this is a list of all the children who came on the kinder transport. Number one name is Abiles Fritz. This is Ben Abiles, who many of you will know. He was uh, a member of the AJR. He was a, he died very recently, very sadly, but he was a very firm campaigner along with Lord Dubbs for today's child refugees. So he's number one on the list because he's Abiles. So 
you can look right through this and there are, you know, the 660 or so names and where they, where they went to and when, when their date of birth was so people can find them. So that was the original reason for the website to have this, this page up so that people could find their history there and uh, see this a uh, little bit of their family story. So another area in the website is, is the trust. Um, with the archive, I thought the best way to hold it for the future was to set up a trust. And with my family, um, my husband, Stephen Watson, and my two children, Lawrence and Holly Watson, we set up the St. Nicholas Winton Memorial Trust to hold the archives for the future. And all of them have helped enormously with this website, with the design. Holly did the, uh, the logo here, which we like very much. Lawrence helped an awful lot with the, with the website and some of the more technical things, as did my husband, Steve, who's done most of the photos, if not all the photos that have gone up there, made sure that they're as good quality as possible. So uh, without them, you know, it certainly wasn't just me. Maybe I did most of the writing, but uh, without them, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. So the, uh, this is talks about the archive, what's in it. And it's really there so that people who want exhibitions, they want research, can come to us and ask for information. We've done a few exhibitions in the flesh, so to speak, one at the Imperial War Museum and one in Maidenhead. And we're happy to loan out items and artifacts for other exhibitions in the future. So um, now we'll go to the exhibition. There are other things, there are other headings. There's memorials, which is a list of places in England and across the world where there are memorials to my father. Um, and there's a page about the biography that I wrote, but we're now gonna look at the exhibition. Um, so the exhibition layout. The exhibition, immediately when we started thinking about it, we came across the problem of what to put in and what not to put in. So this is the home page of the exhibition. We decided that we wanted to make it accessible to as many people as possible. So that was not only people who already knew the story well and wanted lots and lots of extra information, but also those who didn't really know the story at all. So we didn't want to make it overwhelmed with information. We wanted to make there just enough information to keep people's interest, but not too much to make people bored. So throughout we have um, a little bit of information in the black type headings here, um, but also extra information that people can get to if they want more information by looking at the pictures, looking at the captions and going on to the links which take you to further information. So the first page shows the exhibition chapters. There are six chapters, which I felt were the way that um, was the easiest way to lay out the archive. A lot of material we have on my father's early life here, uh, photographs, um, documents uh, about him and his family, his school life. Um, and then there's the, area that we think most people are going to be interested in, the Czech and Slovak kinder transport. The dilemma that we have uh, with the archive is that the biggest item of the archive, the most important item, was given, donated by my father to Yad Vashem in 1989. So we only have copies of this. We don't have the originals, but nevertheless, we have access to the copies and we can make them available most people aren't going to be able to go to Jerusalem to look at the originals. So we have pictures of it that we can use online. Uh, the wartime and post-war work is the next chapter. This includes an awful lot of original material and again, some copies because my father donated uh, his album of his RAF time to the RAF exhibition in Hendon. 
So the originals are there. And again, we have copies of that bit. But we do have copies of many of his writings from that period. Uh, and I feel that one of the interesting things about this is that rather than describe my father's character, I feel that his writings do that. They show his interests, his diaries show what he was interested in, his writings show even during his time in the Red Cross, he's writing about the refugees that he sees as the Germans start coming across and into France. He's already talking about the refugees and that you'll see um, in one of the uh, pages of notes that he writes in that chapter. Then there's the chapter on family life and his time um, in Maidenhead and his charitable work there. We had some very nice photos of that time. Unfortunately, we were unable to get permission to put some of them up. So some of his work with MenCap, where we would have liked to have shown some of the delightful photos, we weren't able to do that. So that's unfortunate, but that's, um, that's the necessity. Then on to the more recent times from 1988 onwards, which we've called recognition. Um, and this really is from the time when the story became public in 1988, right through to um, uh, his, his death in 2015 and beyond. And finally, we felt it was very important as a family that we honor Nikki's view about his story and his views about life, which was that talking about history, he felt, I mean, many of you will have heard him say this, that talking about history is a waste of time unless it has some impact on today. And that was very much his view. So we felt that part of his legacy was influencing how people act today. So we felt it was important to have this final chapter, which is about today and how people can take inspiration from what he did then and act today. So we're gonna have a little look through the chapters now. I'm not gonna spend much time on it because we don't have much. So um, maybe let's go straight into the Czech and kinder, uh, Slovak kinder transport. So this is the chapter obviously that many people will be interested in. Uh, there is a, a link to kind of contextualize that. But if you see here, the big black writing is the story for those who just want the story in simple terms. And for those who want to read more, then they can go into these documents. So here is a document from the scrapbook, which is a letter to his mother written on the 1st of January, 1939. And people can make this bigger. Uh, you can click on that and make it bigger and then you can see it. Now I've got to undo that somehow. Do I know how to do that? Mm, not really. But basically one of the bits of feedback we had from uh, our early tasters to this was, you know, make it so that people can read the, the, uh, the pictures. So we've made sure they come out nice and big so people can read that extra information. But many people will only want to read this black uh, summary, if you like, of the story, and others will want to delve deeper into the information. So again, here's another letter from my father to his mother. And again, the kind of the general story here in the black and white. And then some of the documents from the scrapbook, a couple of telegrams. These are, uh, these are interesting to point out because the second one is dated the 12th of March and says that the first transport was delayed. This is from Trevor Chadwick to my father. And of course, on the 15th of March, uh, which is today, uh, was the date that the Germans occupied the whole of Czechoslovakia. So today is a significant day in the history of Czechoslovakia. And this telegram is the day before 
uh, when things were getting a bit hot in that area. So again, more things from the scrapbook on this page and more of the story being told through this. And this badge, again, some of what we have in this exhibition are artifacts um, rather than just documents so that there's a range of things that you can see from the archives. This badge I found relatively recently in the bottom of a small box of letters and documents and it had obviously been sitting there for 80 years undiscovered and my father obviously had forgotten all about it himself. Um, so I, I, I love that because you know what you can find in your parents grandparents' cupboards when you look. Uh, who knows? So that's, that's the story of this chapter. And this is a picture of the scrapbook, which is the final item in this chapter. And again here, you can go on to the next chapter at the bottom of each chapter, or for those who are really only interested in the kinder transport, they can go straight on. There's a link straight on to the recognition chapter which takes you past the wartime and post-war work and the family history and straight on to the um, recognition. So I, despite the fact that I love the wartime post-war work chapter which is full of fascinating stories of his work in the RAF and in the Red Cross um, in Dunkirk and going through Germany uh, while you know, just post-war, um, uh, we're going to leave that now and go, I think, on to the recognition chapter, which many people will be interested in. So this is about 1987 onwards, uh, when the kinder transport became known about because my father found someone to pass the story on to. And we have the first um, newspaper article in 1988 in the Sunday Mirror, uh, The Lost Children, which was the first big story about the kinder transport that was in the papers. And we have uh, an original copy of that paper from that time. And then of course, the very famous That's Life screening. Uh, we've got a very good clip of it here, which was donated to me very kindly by Gordon Brown, who bought it from the BBC for uh, 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 a video he did a couple of years ago on anti-Semitism and he very kindly, uh, having bought it, donated it on to me with his production company that did the work there. So, so we're very happy to have that. And then the, the story of the recognition and how he began to meet the kinder. He was given this ring by the kinder with the engraving, save one life, save the world. And then some pictures of some of the kinder that he met over the years. I like this picture very much. There you are, Alf, looking young. And uh, I like this picture because uh, it's the only one I have with Carol Rice, the very famous film director who was one of the rescued children. And sadly, uh, he died some years ago, but he did meet my father. And he said to my father that, when the That's Life story came on, it was his opportunity to talk to his children really for the first time about his history. And I think many of the kinder found that was also the case, that this opening up of the story in 1988 became an, a, an opportunity for them to talk to their, their family about this story. So though much of the recognition he got in later life was political recognition, from the Czech and Slovak governments, uh, also from the German and the Swedish governments. Nevertheless, it was the recognition and the meeting of the kinder that was so important. This is a letter that he received from Eva Heyman, who was the sister of Vera Gissing, the lady he met on That's Life, who became a very close friend. And we've put this up with permission of her daughter because it's the most heartfelt, beautiful letter. I have in the archive a whole folder of letters 
from kinder to my father over the years, you know, letters thanking him and writing to him uh, that are all available for, for people who, who, you know, feel that they may have a letter from their parents in there. But particularly this letter seemed to sum up what many people were saying. And um, is very is very beautiful and it's you can see at the top it says answered my father answered all these letters it starts how does one write to how does one thank someone who has saved one's life and many of the letters are like this it's a it's a lovely letter um, right so i've completely lost that and I will now go back to it again. I hope I'm not give, making you seasick with all this movement. You'll see in here there's a link to view Kinder Memories of Nikki. And this is um, for people who want to explore a bit more. These are five Kinder who kindly uh, sent me a bit of information. Milliner, who many of you know. Oh, look, here's Alf again. The nice picture, uh, Leah Lesser, uh, John Fields, and many of you will know these people. And finally, uh, Joe Schlesinger, who sadly is no longer with us, who became a great friend of Nikki, Canadian journalist, who wrote a lovely uh, story about his relationship with Nikki um, because of their, because he lost his parents and found in Nikki uh, a surrogate father, he said. And here uh, in the end are some of the awards that my father received from uh, various governments, including from our own queen and the further awards. Uh, I mean, he's, we've got a, a cupboard full of awards here. Uh, the Order of the Double White Cross from President Schuster and the Order of the White Lion. These are the major awards he received from the government, but he, he did receive many. And so, oh, I'm just going to point this out and then I'm going to stop talking. This was a letter he received from President Bush in 2006. It's a very simple letter, but the reason I like it very much is that it's attached to this article in, a, in the local Maidenhead advertiser. They were very interested in the fact he received this letter. He used it as an opportunity to harangue the local council because at the time he was trying to find a piece of land to build an old people's home. He worked for Abbeyfield, who was a volunteer for the local Abbeyfield charity. So when they came to interview him about the letter, what he wanted to talk about was this old people's home. So it says president's letter, but still no old people's home. And I thought this was so typical of Nikki that the journalist wants to talk about something. He wants to talk about something historical. He wants to talk about something that he's involved with today. And so I couldn't resist putting this up because it really demonstrates him and his character. And then we finish that with a bit about the Winton train, the reconstruction in 2009. And then finally, uh, there's some links to my father's memorial service in 2016 and the concert that took place the next day. Many of the people in the concert who performed were either friends of or, or descendants of the children who were rescued of my father. So it was a very memorable occasion. And then finally, as I've already mentioned, building on Nikki's legacy is about his legacy being the people who are saved and their descendants, but also the call to action that his life embodied, that people should go out and do some good in the world. And this letter in 1939 to the newspapers, imploring people to take a child or to help in some way is here and it can be enlarged to be read properly. But it includes this idea of active goodness, going out and doing something to help, not just somehow being passively good. And this lovely picture by Dora Martinkova, I thought 
really summed up my father and, and, and how he was. And a little clip of him speaking at Seven Oaks School in 2010, again, just a little example of him and his character. And finally, a family photo and wishing everybody to go and be like my father because that's what he would have wanted this, his story to end up with. So um, that's a quick trip through the archive and through the exhibition. And I hope it just given you a sense of what's in there. There's plenty more to look at, but I'll hand over to Alex now. Barbara, thank you so much. That was fantastic. What an amazing accomplishment to, to put all that information online. And I am, um, I think I'm channeling many of the comments here from, from our audience, um, just to give a, a sampling of them. Someone says, this has become a, a labor of love for you, Barbara. This website is a wonderful record for future generations. Fascinating website and stories. Other people write, what a wonderful, inspiring story. Obviously, this website is, so that is, uh, that. That's what's coming across. So well done. Um, a few, just a, a few questions are coming in, and, and um, we have uh, you know sort of ten minutes or so. So if others have questions, please do direct them to me in the chat box. Someone, um, Michael Sharp writes, um, when he was in Prague in 2019, he was told that there were plans for a Winton Trail linking the sites of relevance to the story. Is this some? Are you aware of this? Is this something that's still going ahead? I have no idea. It's nothing, heard to do, nothing to do with me anyway. No, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's fascinating. But it's but... possible if, if, if people look at the memorials um, chapter, there, it shows some of the things in Prague. There's the statue on uh, the main station, plus the children's farewell memorial in the main thoroughfare in the station. There's a little uh, memorial on Petrian Hill in the orchard there, and there is um, a tree in on the path of personalities in the botanical gardens. Okay. Um, I think those are the main things in Prague. Um, a, another question from the audience. Um, someone asked if Nikki ever had any interaction with the Quakers who were engaged in similar work um, from Nazi Germany, from inside Nazi Germany. Obviously. I'm sure in Prague he must have met the Quakers who were there and certainly some of the names in the scrapbook uh, of people who were helping, I think were Quakers too. Uh, there's a round tree and so on, I think was a Quaker. So I'm sure he did. Um, he met so many, he was only in Prague for three weeks, but he met a huge range of people and a huge range of organizations who were over there all doing their bit. What he felt was there was a bit that people weren't dealing with and that was the bit he decided to deal with and that was the children. So he kind of found a niche that he felt wasn't being particularly focused on, whereas all these other organizations were all focusing on their own areas of expertise and Doreen Warriner uh, was focusing on the wanted adults, the people who would be under threat if Hitler invaded because they were on Hitler's wanted list. So they were mainly politicians uh, from the Sudetenland. You mentioned Doreen Warner, and, and I know uh, when we've had you on before and when you were on the podcast, one of the points that you were keen to stress was that I think one of the common misconceptions of your father's story was how much of a sort of, you know, like this idea that he was working alone, but you know, he obviously, there were obviously others, you know, involved in, in lots of other ways. Um, one person wrote in to um, comment on the Trevor Chadwick Memorial Trust. Um, Josephine writes, Trevor did so much work in organizing the transports in Prague, taking great risks for many months under the Nazi regime and has not been recognized, certainly um, not nearly to the extent that your father has. A statue is planned to be erected in Swanage where he lived and taught before the war. Um, and she invites all to visit the uh, the Trevor Chadwick dot, it says Trevor Chadwick dot UK is the, is the website. Yes, it's great to hear about that. I mean, I think that's a really great initiative. I mean, my father was always keen to stress that he did this work with a group. The problem was that the journalists were keen to shape the story 
to make it as dramatic as possible and to focus on one person. And my father being the only person from that story who was still alive, uh, they focused on him and ignored what he said about uh, not being a lone hero, as they like to call it. But uh, he, he, he protested in vain uh, on many occasions. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it's great to see other people filling those gaps, finding their piece of the jigsaw and, 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 and making that, that story uh, clear. And Trevor and Doreen uh, are both getting some attention now, which is, which is great. I went to something not long, I think, before the, uh, the first lockdown where Doreen Warriner was um, recognized at UCL in London. And I think her college at Oxford is just about to do the same. Uh, and Henry Warriner, who's written a wonderful biography of Doreen, which is full of um, in enormous detail. So it's lovely that all those things are happening now and balancing out the intense attention my father got while he was, while he was alive. I agree. And you talk about those gaps. I'm going to take my, my uh, prerogative as, as, as chair of the Q and A, to ask a question about just from the educational perspective. I mean, this is a, you know a, a website that could, is educational both in the in the formal sense. You could absolutely imagine you know teachers and students making use of it, and in the informal sense, lots of people could learn about his his story who who aren't you know learning about it formally in, in a school setting. And I'm wondering, you know, you, you talked about the other people who were involved, but what are, what do you think are the the gaps that you wish that people would understand more about your father's story and that this website might help them to learn more about? Well, I think it it shows other aspects of his life. I mean, obviously, when people interviewed him, they wanted to know about the kinder transport. He he felt when he made his papers available and he took them to Yad Vashem, that what people would be, I mean, what he thought originally people would be most interested in was the work he did after the war for the International Refugee Organization, which was in reparations, where he was involved with collecting the loot that the Nazis had stolen from their victims and converted it into currency uh, through the Paris Agreement, uh, most of which went to the Jewish agency in Israel uh, for the formation of the State of Israel. And, you know, his pictures of that time uh, are just extraordinary and unique. And he thought this is the story everybody would want to hear. And, you know, was quite surprised when it became the kinder transport that was the main story. Of course, none of us had recognized that the children of the kinder transport were there and searching for their history. And of course, for them, you know, this was most important and most necessary. And of course, when we started meeting them, we recognized that too, that, you know, these were these are living people who hadn't understood their own history. So, you know, that other part of his life I feel is important and also, just seeing him in the round as a human being. He wasn't a superman. He wasn't a special per I mean, he was a special person, but he didn't have anything super special that any of us couldn't say, you know, I could do that. What, what he had was the sense that nobody else was doing it. He wasn't going to wait for someone in authority to suddenly come from behind and, and do it. It, he saw that it needed doing and he decided to do it and that was part of his character and looking through the rest of the exhibition you'll see in his life he took on challenges none of them as great as that one but nevertheless you know something needed doing and so he took it on and so you know we hope our, our family hope that people will learn from that that if they start moaning one day that something needs doing they'll go oh wait a minute perhaps that should be me, perhaps that person who needs to do it is me. And, you know, that's the lesson, that's what we feel the lesson of his story is, and hopefully this exhibition will demonstrate that. Brilliant. Um, thank you. There is a couple of questions um, related that said, um, did your father ever talk about feeling in danger himself from the Nazis? And then someone else weighs in on that, I don't, although I don't think they, they were intending to. Um, 
says the Black Book recently published shows that if the Nazis had invaded, Doreen and Nicholas would have been on the Gestapo hit list. What do you know about the really? date he faced? Oh, I didn't know that. I saw that I thing know. about the Black Books on Twitter, but I didn't know. I can imagine Doreen being on that because she had to flee Prague very quickly. Um, not that long after the Germans, in, well, I guess it was about a month and a bit after the Germans invaded because what she was doing was definitely illegal as far as they were concerned. And Beatrice Wellington, the other uh, very brave Canadian woman who was also helping Doreen, she was actually interrogated by the Gestapo in Prague. Her memorable words during interrogation when she was told by the Gestapo that what she was doing was illegal, turned back to them and said, no, what you are doing is illegal. I mean, that's bravery. My father always said he was not in any danger. He left Prague on the 21st of January, uh, several months before the Germans occupied Prague. He recognized that there were agents of the Germans in Prague who were following him around, but he really didn't feel he was in any personal danger at the time. And certainly it was Doreen and Trevor who were actually there when the Germans were there and Trevor who had to deal with the Gestapo to get the exit visas stamped, who was certainly in, in, in real danger. So I think my father's protestations that he had never been in danger were reasonable ones. If other people have evidence to the contrary or feel that the story should be different, you know, I'd, I'd be glad to hear that. You know, I'm always happy to revise my knowledge, but I don't have any that suggests he was really in danger himself. He's, Unless the Germans invaded England, in which case maybe he would. Oh, well, right, then <laughs> him and many others, presumably. Um, I, I mean, speaking of the the risks that he was he was faced with, I mean, he's uh, he's been honored in all manner of different ways, postage stamps, and you know, all all sorts of other um, medals. He's not right considered righteous among the nations. Someone writes in at Yad Vashem, um, the institution uh, you you mentioned, where the the originals are held in in Israel. Um, do do you feel that uh, that that's that there should be some sort of recognition from there? There was a. I have some correspondence in the archive about that. Hugo Maron, who was one of the children who my father rescued, who he got to know very well. Um, he tried to correspond with my father about this saying he wanted to get him recognized and my father wrote back and saying well because he was Jewish this was not going to happen <laughs> and um, and it's an interesting set of correspondence because he talks about his family history in it and so on um, so he didn't fit the profile of righteous amongst the nations because that didn't happen he instead received a letter from the then President of Israel is a Weissman, which we have in the archive. So that was his compensation, if you like, for not receiving that um, award, if you like. Very good. Um, someone else asked this question. I'm glad they did because I, I can, I can um, therefore not have to take credit or blame for it myself. We're, we're only just launching this website and someone has asked, do you have any plans to further develop it? Which I was also wondering, not because it's insufficient as it is, but there's there's great potential here. Do, have you thought about what might come next with this? Well, the original idea, as I said right at the beginning, was to put online what was in the whole archive. Um, you know, that would be great so that people and, and, and to make a lot of it available in digital form. I'm not sure in my lifetime that's gonna happen. Um, you know, if it does, great. I, I'm still working on it. Um, and we may put more, I mean, my husband, Stephen and my son, Lawrence are both able to add to this website um, if we want to. But I think we're going to take a breather for now and 
you know, if people want to see anything in particular, or, you know, there is a, throughout the, the website, there are contact buttons, so people can write and ask for information, uh, or if they have ideas for what they think should be there that's missing, you know, please, please write and say what you feel about it. And, you know, feedback would be very welcome. We didn't put a feedback mechanism within the website. That became, I think we just decided that maybe that wasn't a great idea. You know, maybe it is. Maybe you, you have different ideas. So, you know, we're very happy to receive ideas and thoughts about how to develop it. This was, you know, a, a work that we've done over the last nine months uh, with the help of a very good design company to make it accessible and to look good and to work well. But, um, you know, we're open to suggestions. Well, you talked about taking a breather, and I think that is a very well-deserved thing. Uh, you certainly deserve a breather for now. And I think it's really amazing that this is a, you know, this was just sort of a, a family-run uh, operation that you managed to, to put this all online. I mean, there are so many archives a, a, around the world that aren't available to the public, certainly not as easily available to the public as this, uh, much to the chagrin and frustration of researchers. Um, and so it is, it's, uh, you deserve huge praise for the efforts that you took just on your own steam with your family to put this online. So on behalf of a grateful many thousands of people, uh, thank you for all the effort that you put into that. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to Michael Newman uh, to take us to the next part of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alex, and thank you, Barbara, uh, for that fascinating whirlwind tour of an uh, extensive website. In fact, when I looked through it myself just before we, we spoke originally, just, just in case there wasn't enough of an AJR Winton connection, one of the first pictures you come across is of Nikki as a young boy standing in the garden in Cleve Road. And it just so happens that that address was two doors along from where the AJR had a day center for about 25 years. And even just looking at that picture, the way the house is and the steps down to the garden, I remember the AJR day center, which was similarly, it was a similar kind of pattern. And, and it's just funny to make just of all the places that he, that's where the family was, which is where the AJR had a big part of our work in the 80s and 90s. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you also to those who contributed with questions and comments. Uh, I am conscious of time and I do now want to bring in uh, the ambassador from Slovakia, His Excellency Robert Andrzejak, uh, to say a few words. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Good afternoon once again. Thank you very much. Allow me to thank you, the Association of Jewish Refugees for inviting me to be a part of this exceptional event. It's one of my first uh, public appearances after, after my arrival here to London. So thank you very much once again for this opportunity. It's an honor to be here with you today and to listen to Barbara's presentation. And I'd like to thank, or I'd like to express my deep admiration for the amount of work you did on a new website about your father, the hero. It's uh, in this digital age, it's very important to make such an online exhibition using items from your family archives and safeguard them for the future education and research. The life story of Sir Nicholas Winton is the proof that one person can make a difference, a real difference. It helps us to recognize the qualities of an upstander and ask what it takes for people to become involved. Today, more than ever, one can use the story as a catalyst to facilitate discussions about how we treat each other, how we should live together, what our choices mean, and what is the responsibility of each of us to protect democracy and human rights. The more projects to remember Sir Nicholas Winton and the Holocaust we have, the better. It takes one to do good and another to tell the story. Famous, the famous Slovak director, Matej Minaj, should the feature film All My Loved Ones in 1999 and the full-length documentary Nicholas Winton, The Power of Good in 2000. A free sequel of the documentary called Nicky's Family was shot in 2011, following the life stories of the safe children. 
Some of them are also come from, came from Slovakia, by the way. Sharing these stories and archives is a way to equip next generation with knowledge, skills, and dispositions necessary for civic engagement. It is encouraging each of us to recognize that our participation really matters, just as Sir Nicholas Winston did for the hundreds of Winston children whose lives he saved. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, comments, those, mm -hmm. those remarks. And welcome to London, belatedly. Uh, we, we look forward to working with you and inviting you and indeed Ambassador Seca to our events in the future. Um, Lord Dubs, if I can pass the microphone to you, we're waiting very patiently, I know, and thank you very much for joining us as well this afternoon. Um, I'll, I'll give you the floor to, to have some concluding remarks. Right, well, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for inviting me to make those concluding remarks and to play a part in, in what is a very significant event uh, in, indeed. And, and could, could I just say that Barbara epitomizes what her father said, don't just talk about history, but do things. And Barbara is both a great historian, as we've seen with, with the archives, with what she's done, but she's also a great campaigner. And I've been to many, many campaigning events on behalf of refugee children, contemporary refugee children. And there she is, Barbara in evidence, being supportive, taking a part. So thank you, Barbara, for what you do. Uh, and, and, and the campaigning work you've done, as well as your contribution to enabling us to remember what happened at a very significant period and what a special person Nicky was. Now you say special, I think he was special. He was special because of what he did for the kinder transport uh, children, but he's also special because he's a complete person. There's so many aspects to Nicky that you've brought to light that perhaps we didn't know about because the media coverage simply drew attention to one important aspect of his life. And of course, being the beneficiary, one of the many uh, Winton children wh whose lives he saved, uh, it's, it's no wonder that I, I talk about that more, but he is a complete person. And I think that is absolutely terrific. Um, some of you may know that in off the central lobby in the House of Commons, there is a plaque, which is a thank you plaque to the people of Britain on behalf of the 10,000 children that came on kinder transport from Czechoslovakia uh, Austria and and, um, uh, and 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 Germany, uh, and I always see that plaque as something I'd like to see uh, Nicky Winton uh, associated with that plaque. We did have a um, uh, an event there two or three years ago to commemorate the putting up of the plaque 25 years ago, and we had the chief rabbi and we had the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Speaker of the House of Commons uh, there because we saw it as significant, both not just to commemorate kinder transport. Or they saw it as significant, but also, uh, but also as a tribute to the campaigning work going on for children, and as a to as a token as a token for the future. I'd like to thank both the Czech and the Slovak ambassadors both for what they've said and for being here. And I'll say to the Czech ambassador because of course I have many memories of birthday parties for Nikki Winton taking place at the Czech and Slovak embassies. And we had there were, there were great occasions. And of course, many of us who came over on the Kinder Transport were there to uh, were there to celebrate and commemorate. And I'm sure some of Barbara's photographs will, will have been taken at one or the other of the of the embassy reception rooms when we were all there uh, having a lot of fun. I remember I don't know if it was on that there or or, or at an event in Bratislava, but I said to Nikki, "How are you?" I think he was about 102 at the time, and Nikki said, "I'm fine from the neck upwards." He had a sense of humour. He had a commitment. He had a passion. He was a great conversationalist, wonderful to talk to. I loved sitting, he loved talking about politics. Loved, and I, I, I regarded him as a friend. Can I just tell you just a little story about how, what I think would have pleased Nicky because of his view that it has to be for the future. And I was invited to a school in Bethnal Green, it was a maintained school, all Muslim boys, or pretty well, I, judging by appearance, they're all, certainly all boys, all Muslim boys. And I was there to speak because they're about 14 and 15 year olds. And the project was, they were working a double project, kinder transport and the Holocaust. And I think the idea that a school of Muslim boys in the East End of London would be devoting a particular project for the young people to kinder transport uh, and the Holocaust, I think was a, was a good sign of how 
the message is getting there, has to get to more schools, but the message is getting there. And I, I found that I found that a, a, a very moving occasion, as I have done the many events by faith communities, especially by the Jewish community, uh, commemorating both Nikki Winton and also talking about campaigning uh, uh, on, on behalf of child refugees. The first time I went to Calais to look at the jungle there, there were 12 of us, five rabbis in one go. Now, you probably get five rabbis in one go, Michael, but most people don't. And, and it was a sign, again, of the commitment. And, it, and I saw these things and anything I've done for child refugees as part of the legacy of Nikki and something I'm, I'm doing because what Nikki did, we have to carry, carry, the, carry the torch forward. So I would say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for putting this on. Thank you, Barbara, for the fantastic work you've done. And thank you all. And we're taking the message forward. The message is there to be taken forward. The history of Nikki Winton is a sign of what can be done. The thing that was special about Nikki, a lot of people in life, they see a situation, they see a problem, and they just uh, say, oh, that's awful, and walk away. Nikki was different. He saw it and he did not walk away. And that's up to all of us not to walk away. I think we all have a responsibility for refugees today. And we're going to take that forward. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Dubs, for those in inspiring words. Um, I can confirm we have had events with five rabbis and it's a lot of opinions. But I think that message holds true, and I think it's a perfect way, perfect message to take forward from the event today and also uh, for the future. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to everybody for participating today, to Ambassador Seca, uh, to Ambassador Andrzejczak, to Alex for hosting the uh, Q&A session, to my colleague Susan, who organised the event. And I think biggest uh, congratulations to Barbara for putting together the excellent website. Uh, this is a virtual hand clap that everybody's giving you. There you are, there's a lot of, lot of hands going together there. Uh, congratulations, um, and please do take the time, the, the link has been posted onto the chat function, copy it into your browsers and explore it. And as we say at these events, we look forward to seeing you at future events. Uh, safe journeys home, keep well, stay in touch. Thank you everybody, bye bye now. <laughs>